We have to look at both sides of the, uh, the equation of the human factor. There is demand for human factor that can innovate, and there is a certain degree of supply of talents in that, uh, in that area. What is striking is that in the current world, mobility has increased. So on paper, there's more human factor available for innovation worldwide. They can travel, they can operate in different uh, countries, and yet we faced a blatant uh, discrepancy between what is available uh, in terms of manpower and what labor markets do. It is clear that if we look at what the most successful innovative countries or innovative companies have been, uh, the human factor has been critical. Uh, people regard Apple, for instance, as the most innovative company in the world, and it's difficult to do that without mentioning the name of Steve Jobs. Yet, when trying to emulate such successes, uh, many countries are focusing on the total ecosystem around these companies, around these organizations, and not just the individuals. And this is critically uh, important. Uh, for example, if we look at Switzerland, which is again the champion of GII this year, a critical factor in stimulating innovation in Switzerland has been the apprenticeship uh, scheme, whereby uh, kids in school can actually start working in companies at a much earlier age and then get back to the, their studies. This has to do with how you manage the human factor and not just the top uh, two or three well-known uh, innovators. Clearly, we see a number of best practices emerging all around the world. And these best practices are of different kinds. Uh, we have the examples of education systems, which have been able to reform themselves, to get closer to the labor markets, to provide the ability uh, to students to think outside of the box, to be uh, entrepreneurial, to be innovative, which means to challenge some of the, the methods used actually to, to teach what they are supposed to, to learn. This is largely of a cultural nature. Beyond the cultural environment, there's a certain number of elements that can be put into place to allow startups, to allow small and medium-sized enterprises to benefit and to grow around research centers, around universities. Uh, one of the challenges for emerging countries is that they don't have the large universities, the large industrial consortiums that other more developed countries enjoy. And there, the ability to have individuals who can get their training, to can get their education abroad, then come back home, apply it locally, and then expand uh, globally is critically important. This three-step process, learn abroad, apply locally, and expand globally, is a key uh, path for successful innovation. It is true that if we look at the results of GII 2014, we see on one hand stability at the top. The top 20 have not changed much since the creation of the index. And we see that this innovation divide that separates the champion from the rest of the countries is still very much there. However, we also see reason to hope. We see that indeed a number of emerging countries are uh, opening new ways, ushering new ways by which you can become a successful innovator. The uh, main merit of GII has been to actually to quantify many items that uh, everybody told us this you cannot quantify, uh, especially the human factor. This is too difficult to, to do. Yet, uh, by putting some figures on top of some very fuzzy ideas like creativity, like ability to think differently, we have given governments, policymakers on one hand, and investors, the business sector on the other hand, the possibility to have a constructive dialogue. Uh, it's not a panacea, it's not the end of the, uh, of the journey, but it has proved to be remarkably efficient in mobilizing energies to promote innovation.